Power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Several years ago, I was asleep, and I had a dream. And in that dream, um, there was this huge tornado coming up the street. And I was kind of trying to stay ahead of the tornado, and it was one of those big, ugly black ones with the long tail coming out of a black cloud. And uh, something that I used to see a lot growing up out in the tornado alley. And it wasn't an uncommon sight, but it was uncommon in my dreams. And as this tornado got closer, I began to realize it wasn't a tornado at all. It was a serpent. And this serpent was just massive, and it was, it was uh, uh, lightning and, and flashes of light were coming out of its eyes and its mouth, and, and it was coming down the street very menacing-like. And I saw these two little children playing in, in a yard, and I grabbed them up and ran to their house, and their mother opened the door, and, and I took these two little kids. They were black kids, and the mother was this very nice-looking, very, very... Uh, uh, well manicured, well kept uh, black lady and she invited me in and she said what's going on and I said well there's something really awful going on outside and so your kids need to be in the house and about that time this this uh, this serpent came and surrounded that house I mean, you could see its tail completely surrounding the house and then she had this skylight over her kitchen and you could see its face and its breathing and the lightning and flashing and, and, and just, I mean, just right into that skylight. And I'm in the house and all I'm doing is saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I just kept rebuking and rebuking. And she, this lady, she had, she had a piano in her living room and she goes over to the, to the piano and starts playing. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. And I was, and I'm rebuking, and I'm rebuking, and I could feel the heat from the flames that were coming out of this snake's eyes and mouth. I could feel it on my face. It was so real. Y'all interested in knowing what happened? Okay. Uh, I just kept, I just kept in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I command you to die. And man, I'm I'm screaming it out. And suddenly the lights went out and all you could see was the the skeleton of this serpent and it just collapsed in the yard. And I look out in the yard and there's nothing but bones left. Just just this big this big pile of bones. And the clouds went away, the sun came out, and peace returned. And I woke up to my wife shaking me, saying, what's going on? What's going on? And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, oh, I, I heard you just screaming, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I, so I told her about my dream. And, and you know what? Uh, you say, well, what was God showing you? Uh, I don't know, except that there's power in that name. Yeah. And uh, we win if we, know, if we believe in that name. Yeah. You, now I wouldn't have planned on telling you that story. That song just brought it up, and uh, but that's a good story, yes, amen. amen. And I think about that every every time I confront the enemy, I think about the power that is in that name. And Jesus said, "Whoever calls on that name will be saved." Salvation comes to whoever calls on that name, and uh, I'm I'm glad that you brought that up because let's look in Romans ten. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about calling on the name of Jesus or calling on Jesus. And Romans chapter 10 talks about that in relation to your salvation. You know, you can't be saved without the name of Jesus. I heard of a missionary one time that uh, was trying to get into the deep, dark jungles of Africa. And uh, he couldn't find a way in there. There was no way that he could get permission to go in and cross borders and that sort of thing. And it was in an area where no one had ever gone to preach the gospel. And so he got this, this idea that he would hire an airplane, one of these small bush pilot type airplanes, and uh, uh, they would have them fly him over the jungle. And he got some scripture uh, uh, 
this Romans chapter 10 and verse, um, let's see, verse 8 through 13 talks about this, but verse 13 was what he wrote down on these slips of paper, and he wrapped them up in uh, little, uh, 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 like round candy cane type things, and he threw them out the window. And so all the, and it was in, in the language of the, of the native tribes there, and all it said was, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Years and years and years later, another missionary goes to this, finally makes it to this area, and he finds he finds this these villages that are uh, uh, that are totally Christian, totally saved, have churches there, and uh, and and when he when he inquires about it, they show him this little slip of paper. It says, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Well, they didn't know the name of the Lord, but so they just called him Lord, and they called upon the Lord to be saved, and they all got saved. And they were asking this missionary, would you please tell us his name? And the, and the missionary said his name is Jesus. Well, they were just thrilled. And, I mean, they had revival after that because they, they, they heard the name. But one verse of Scripture dropped it out of the sky, and it saved that whole village. And they didn't even know the name. All they knew that he was the Lord. And so they, they say, whoever you are, Lord, we're calling upon your name. And he saved them. <laughs> and that's not, you know, I've heard other stories similar to that, where people just on the tiniest little bit of information, they became born again because God is so eager. He's so eager to, uh, uh, to save people, to help people. God wants to help people. And uh, Romans ten eighteen says, What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You see, that missionary put the word in those people's hearts and mouths when he dropped it out of the sky. One word from God can change everything. And, uh, and, and, of course, Paul is writing to the Romans, and he says the word that will save you is the very word we put in your mouth and we put it in your heart. In other words, you've heard about Jesus. You've heard the gospel. And if you will believe what you've heard and speak it out of your mouth, it has the power to save you. He said, and if thou shalt confess with... Here, here's the word. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> and I want you to, I want to point out here, he didn't say the Savior Jesus. He says the Lord Jesus. If you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And, and the, the, the inclination there is you're making him your Lord. He's not just a Lord or the Lord, but he's your Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, he's a living Lord, right? Thou shalt be saved. That word saved is sozo. It means spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, in every way you need rescuing, he'll do it. He's not just the Savior of your soul. He's the Savior of your life. He's the Savior of your whole being. He'll save your body. He'll save your spouse's body. He'll save your dog. Because the dog is a part of your life. I've had God heal my dogs many times. We had one little dog got run over by a car. And we, pulled, you know, we, we lifted her up out of the middle of the street. And carried her to her little dog house and set her down. And we could see her hip bone sticking out through her skin. I was eight years old. I wasn't even born again. I was just an eight year old heathen boy. But I knew enough about God from my parents to know that God cared. And so me and my brothers, my cousins, and a couple of our neighbor kids, we formed a circle around little tiny little chihuahua there with her hip sticking out. We knew that if daddy came home and found her in that condition, he'd put her out of her misery. 
because that's what people did back in those days. They didn't spend thousands of dollars on a pet. They just put them out of their misery and get another pet. But we loved Tiny, and we didn't want Daddy to put Tiny out of her misery. And so we gathered around her little dog house, and we held hands, and we called on the name of the Lord. A bunch of little kids. My cousins will tell you, they, they remember that. My sister was there. She remembers that. I mean, we all remember the same thing. The story stays the same. Over the years, it stays the same. But we prayed and prayed, and suddenly, Tiny jumps up and takes off running, runs around the house, runs out into the street, and chases another car. <laughs> Tiny lived to be 22 years old and died of emphysema. She didn't die of a broken hip. But I want to tell you that that, that really impressed us kids. I didn't get saved that day, but I was on my way. I was on a slippery slope to you know, salvation because I, I discovered that God cares about kids and their pets. And God cares about you. And that word saved is, is a big word. It's a little word in the language, but it's a big word in its meaning. And it means your whole life, your whole being. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Excuse me, i got to wash down a little tickle. No, don't y'all wish you had something. Mm. Well, I want to share a couple of facts with you this morning. Number one is that Jesus can help you. Jesus can help help you <clears throat> say it Jesus can help me Jesus can help me there is no doubt about his power we were singing about it there is no doubt about what he can do there's no question about his ability to for example heal the blind we have biblical record of it not once, not twice, but over and over, he caused the blind to see. We know that Jesus can heal the blind. We also know uh, uh, from uh, uh, personal experiences, like you just asked Sister Brenda over here, if Jesus can heal eyes. Right there on the front row, little Baptist girl. She found out that Jesus heals eyes. And her eyes are getting better and better and better as time goes on. And, uh, and we know that Jesus can raise the dead. Because in the Bible, He raised the dead over and over again. He raised, he raised somebody that was just dead, Jairus' daughter. He raised another guy that was just dead for a few hours. The widow of Na the 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 widow of Nain's daughter, her son, stopped the funeral procession, raised him off of the funeral beer, you know. Ruined it, crashed the funeral. Then we found out that he, he can raise somebody who's been dead for four days and already started corrupting when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that we have the biblical record that Jesus can raise, the, he can heal the blind, he can raise the dead. Amen. We know we know we find out what he can do just by following them around in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We also know that he raises the dead today, doesn't he, Harold? I know of what two occasions at least that Harold, right there, has died. But he's still with us. Go figure. He he can do it. How many of you believe he can do it? Amen? Praise God. Well, so it's not a question then of can he do it? Amen? It's not a question of can he do it. We know he can. We know if we call upon the name of Jesus that we can and will be saved. Praise God for that. Amen. Okay. Look in Psalms chapter 121. And uh, in, in response to this, knowledge that Jesus can help you, that Jesus can save you. 
you need to uh, you need to respond by looking to him for help. Amen? Amen. Psalm 121 verse 1 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And he wasn't talking about uh, hills there surrounding Jerusalem. He was talking about the hills of the Lord or Mount Zion. I lift my eyes up unto the hills of God where God is enthroned and my help comes from him. My help comes from the one who made heaven and earth. Well, that's just another indication of he can. Not only uh, uh, is Jesus demonstrated that he can do it, but God our Father has demonstrated through Jesus and in, uh, throughout the scriptures that he can save us. David was the king of Israel. And David relied upon God for help. If, the, if a king relies on God for help and has this testimony that my help came from the Lord, help came, then who are we to say we don't need his help? Only an idiot would talk like that, and we're not idiots. Uh, look in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. He says, let your conversation. Now this word conversation means your whole lifestyle. Let your lifestyle, not just uh, the words that come out of your mouth, but conversation means your whole manner of living. Whole manner of let your lifestyle be without covetousness. He's talking about an attitude of the heart, where you're always wanting stuff. You're always wanting something that's not yours. You're all you're never satisfied with what you've got. You're always wanting what somebody else has. He says, "Be content with such things as you have." And you think, well, you know, why was God want to just limit us to what we have? Well, you need to understand what you have. Yeah. You've got everything. So why would you why would you covet what someone else has when you've already got everything? Be, you need to realize what's what you've got. What he's what he's saying here is you don't understand what you have. If you understood what you had going for you, you'd never ever ever covet what somebody else has. Amen? Amen. He goes on to explain. For is that word for, which means I said this because or so. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen. You see, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has said, the God who can do anything, the God of all creation, the God who's almighty and all powerful, He said that He would always be with us. He would never leave us. He also promised that He would never forsake us. If you study that word forsake, it means to leave you in the condition that I found you. In other words, if Jesus comes on the scene He's not just going to be a spectator who sits by and sympathizes with your misery, but He's going to bring you out. He's going to help you. Jesus is saying here that I am with you to help you. God is in your life to help your life. Supernatural divine power is come to help you. Help you help you. Amen? And so we may boldly say what? The Lord is my helper. Or as we'd say in Texas, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You will no longer have any fear of man. You'll have no fear of circumstances because you know that wherever you go, whatever you're uh, involved in whatever is happening in your life, God is there helping you. He's your helper. Say, the Lord is my helper. 
Amen. Years ago, I had a Christian school in our church, and and I would I would go and teach the students uh, on every Friday. We would have a chapel service, and I would go teach the students. And we uh, uh, I taught them this lesson about we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. And I said, from now on, if you hear me say the word boldly, I want you to say the Lord is my helper. Yes. And so from then on, I would walk through the school, I'd come into their classrooms, and I'd see these students, you know, just struggling with a test or struggling with something. And I would just say boldly in the whole class, the Lord is my helper. <laughs> and of course, I taught my kids at a very early age that to uh, make their confession, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And my children would get a spanking in my house if they said, I can't. Because I taught them that they can. I said, I said, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The Bible says, the Lord is your helper. So you, if you say, I can't, then you're telling a lie. And we spank you for lying. Yeah, I, did, I spanked my kids. I whooped them. Well, that was the way I was brought up. Amen. I turned out all right. I turned out all right. I, I turned out all right. And you know what? They turned out all right too. My kids are now in their mid to late 40s and they're still doing things that made me say, well, I want, maybe I shouldn't have taught them that. Because they go out and do things that scare me. My kids have scared me. Because they believe they could do anything. Right. Amen. Through Christ which strengthens them. Amen. And so they do They do some amazing things. But, I'm, but they're serving the Lord. And they're full of faith. And they're full of confidence. Because you know what? They're convinced that God is with them. And that He loves them. Amen. So uh, you know. We, we need to understand. Yes He can help us. And He will help us. Praise God. I've called upon Jesus many times. And He's helped me. Many, you know, there have been a few times when that's all I had time for was to say, Lord, help. Jesus, help. But like the scripture said, he was a present help in the time of need. Psalm 46 uh, says that he is a present help in the time of need. And so uh, I remember when I was 17 years old. Yes, I can still remember that far back. I was 17 years old and I was a senior in high school and uh, all of our high school counselors were telling us we need to start making provision to apply to go to you know colleges or whatever. And I was already called into the ministry. I was already uh, working on uh, my license to preach. I had an exhorter's permit <laughs> with my uh, organization and I was, I was uh, just waiting until I turned 18 so I could get a license to preach. But I was already out preaching, holding youth revivals. I'm in high school. And uh, public high school. And they're saying, well, you need, to, you need to make plans to go to college. My pastor called me in and said, you're going to college. <laughs> well, no Thomason had ever gone to college. You know, it was, you know, there, there was no one in my family or even extended family that had ever gone to college. And uh, yet my pastor said, I'm going to college. And I wanted to please my pastor. I lived to please him and Jesus. And so he looked like Jesus too. And so, you know, uh, I, I said, oh, yes, sir, I'm going to college. And so I started uh, uh, looking at Bible colleges because I'm going to be a preacher, right? So I started looking at Bible college. And I, I went down to Southwestern Assemblies of God College in Waxahachie, Texas. I looked at the campus and I just didn't feel like I didn't get any witness that I was supposed to go there. And so I, I, I drove over to Springfield, Missouri, the holy city of the Assemblies of God. And I looked at Evangel College and I looked at Central Bible College and, and uh, went on campus. And I, I just didn't feel any witness that this, was, that this was where I should be. And then on the way back from Springfield, Missouri, back to Texas, well, I went through Tulsa and I said, you know, all Roberts University is here. Uh, I'll go look at their campus. Well, when I went to their campus, it was like space age 
like the Jetsons had built it or something. And it was beautiful. And, and I thought, oh, I would love to come here. And so I go back to uh, I go back home and I begin to investigate and I found out that they had this uh, uh, special weekend Easter weekend they would have this they'd send all their students home and they would open up the dorms for high school students to come and they would give them a free weekend on campus so that they could look at the school meet the meet the teachers and and get some idea you know and basically so they could sell them on the idea going to Oral Roberts University. And so I signed up for this free Easter week, and all I had to do was get there. They were going to feed me and house me and all that. All I had to do was get there. And so I remember on Good Friday before Easter of that year, that was 1968, I got in my little Mercury Comet, and I took off for Tulsa. And about 9 o'clock in the morning, I was near a town called Weatherford, Oklahoma, and it was raining and I, I, I go to pass a Volkswagen, loaded down with all his worldly goods. It was, a, a, you know, an, an army guy, and he was loaded down. He was being transferred. So this little Volkswagen, he had all his worldly goods in it, driving slow. And so I pull out, and I'm going around. And as soon as I pull out and back to get in front of him, I had a blowout. And that car just flipped and rolled and flipped, and it flipped three and a half times and went over the median upside down of Interstate 40, hit the other side, the other two lanes, and scooted on its top all the way across and hit a, a, a pile of sand that the road crews had left there and stopped before it went off over into a ravine. It's upside down. The wheels are still spinning. All the windows are burst out and steam is rising from the upside down engine and I crawl out the passenger door. Oh, by the way, that back in those days, cars didn't have seat belts. So I was bouncing around inside that. And all I had time for, people, all I had time for was Jesus, help! I stood up. I brushed the broken glass off of myself. I looked at that car. The wheels are spinning. Steam is rising. Rain is falling. People are coming to a stop and running over, asking, where's the dead guy? Where's the dead guy? And I said, there's no dead guy. Well, where the, where's the injured people? I said, there's no injured people. Well, who was in the car? I was the only one in there. One old guy, you know, started, started witnessing to me, trying to get me saved. I said, I'm already saved. I'm already saved, you know. And, uh, and, but all I had time for that day was to call on the name. And guess what? He was present to help me. That car was totally smashed. The, the roof was smashed all the way down to the seat. I don't know how I wasn't smashed in there with it. But I would, didn't have a scratch on my body. Didn't have a bruise on my body. I had glass in my socks, in my underwear. I had glass everywhere, but I had no cuts on me. I called my dad and I said, Dad, I had a blowout and wrecked the car. He said, I'll be right there. And he must have driven 120 miles an hour to get there because he got there pretty quick. He had a log chain in one hand and a spare tire in the other. <laughs> I took him down to the, the, uh, the shop where they had towed the car into and pulled back these big shop doors and there was the car sitting on the, in the middle of the floor and it was about this tall. He dropped the chain, dropped the spare tire and wept. He realized it had been a miracle. And all the way back home, I'm thinking, I guess the Lord doesn't want me to go to Oral Roberts University. Because, you know, back in those days, we thought God did stuff like that to people to teach them a lesson. And if I were to interpret the same thing now, I'd probably think, well, maybe the devil didn't want me to go there. I don't know. But I didn't go there. I didn't go to Waxahachie. I didn't go to Evangel College in Springfield. I, I enrolled that fall in West Texas State University, 27 miles from my house, and, and went to college there for four years. But, uh, you know, it's amazing how God directs the steps of, of people. 
But I learned something that day, and I learned something very valuable. All I have to do is ask. I don't have to have a pretty prayer. I don't have to go through any kind of, you know, uh, penance or contortions of, of paying for it. The Lord's help is freely offered, and all I have to do is ask. Amen? So you need, uh, you know, fact number two is you need, to, you need help, and you need to admit that you need help. Amen. There's something about people that for some reason they get full of pride. Men are real bad about this. They don't want to ask anybody for help, and they and they come up with real, really stupid things like, "God, I don't want to bother you." How many of you know God's already put Himself out? He's already put Himself out for you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That that's been put out. Jesus hung on a cross for you. God's already been bothered. And you say, I don't want to bother him. I don't want to put him out. I don't want to take up his time. He's got more important things to do. That is pride. It's false humility, which is pride. And, and uh, you know, you need to admit that you need help. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God, you need help. <laughs> you need God's help. Amen. Turn to the neighbor on the other side and look at him and say, boy, you really need help. <laughs> Swallow your pride. 1 Peter 5, listen, 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. You don't want God resisting you. You don't want God standing in opposition to you. That word resisteth there is a military word that means lining up all your troops against somebody. You don't want God lining up all his troops against you. You want the God of Romans 8.28 who is making all things work together for you, for your good. Not working against you. So pride, pride causes God to be on the wrong side of the things. But he will give grace to the humble. Well, grace is God's unmerited favor, but it's also the expression of God working in your life. It's the reflection of God being with you. It's the help of God. You see, you want people to get the idea that God helps you. Well, you better leave him alone because God helps him. You know, Abraham had that testimony. Others had that testimony. You think David had that testimony? Well, you better leave that boy alone because God helps him out. See, he learned, he learned to humble himself and admit that he needed God. If you read, you read through the Psalms, you're going to see that in David everywhere, all through his whole life. He knew he needed God. And he knew he had to rely on God. And so he would call on God. Early in the morning he would call on God. Late at night he would call on God. He, he was always asking God for help. Read those. You know, I could have I pulled up a whole bunch of verses. Just from David's talking about needing God's help. Well, if David needed God's help. And Paul needed God's help. And Peter needed God's help. I need God's help. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. And look at verse 7. Casting all your cares upon Him for He careth for you. Casting means to thrust with great force. Doesn't mean to lay it at His feet. It means throw it at His feet. What? All your care. That word care means concerns, worries, anxieties, dreads, forebodings, fears, all of them. Anything that troubles you, 
cast it at his feet with great force. Why? Because he cares for you. He's there to help. He's there to help. He's your helper. Let him help. Humble yourself. You see, letting Jesus help you is a uh, an outward expression of true humility. Asking for his help and letting him help you is humility. Fact number three is, if you call, he'll answer. Psalm 62, 1 says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Psalm 50, verse 14, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay your vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 55, 16, As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Amen. Amen. Psalm 91. You ever heard of Psalm 91? Verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. He said, I will be with you in trouble. To do what? To deliver you. God says, I will be with you in trouble to deliver you. To help you. Amen? Asian cultures, and you know, I've, I'm interested in Asia, uh, planning on going there again. I've been to India, Myanmar, Nepal, and uh, supported missionaries throughout Asia. And uh, I've, I've studied some of their culture. And when, when they read Romans, that scripture that says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, they don't read it the way we do. They understand it uh, in Eastern culture to mean I call the Lord's name upon myself. Or I call myself by the Lord's name. In other words, I own whoever, whoever and whatever the Lord is. I call that upon myself. Whosoever shall call the Lord's name upon themselves is calling everything that He is to come to bear in their life. That's why we're saved. We're, we're saved because we identify with Jesus. We are saved because we identify ourselves as belonging to Jesus. We become His possession. He bought us. We're not our own. But we're bought with a price. Amen? And we seek only to glorify Him. And so when we read that, when they read that scripture, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, they read that scripture to mean when I identify with Jesus and call his name upon myself or call myself by his name, I'm one of his, then I get all that he has to offer. That's salvation. Salvation is everything God has to offer. It's yours simply by calling his name upon yourself. Branding yourself with his name. I'm his. And that's why he cares for me. He cares for his own. He takes care of whoever is given to him. Amen? He shows mercy to everybody. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. God is good to the sinner. Matter of fact, the scripture says that the goodness of God causes men to repent. God is good to people. God, God helps people who don't deserve his help. But his own, his own children, who are called by his name, who have an inheritance in him, who are sealed in his blood, who are marked by his mark, branded with his brand, he for sure 
takes care of his own. Amen? If he's going to help a, a sinner, he's going to help his own. That's just what you call common sense. Good reason. Truth. And it's also a fact. I look out here, I don't see anybody that has not called themselves a Christian. I don't see anybody that has not claimed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You, you, you've called on His name to save you from your sins. Am I right? Amen? Well, I, I'm, so why am I preaching this? I'm preaching this because this morning I woke up and I, I could hear in my spirit the Lord saying, I want to help them. I want to help them. Tell them to call on me. So the Lord wants to help you. Amen. And I've done everything I, I can do. I, I, I've, I've encouraged you now. Call, now it's your job to call on it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so I, I, want, I want to pray for some individuals, uh, people that need a, you know, extra help. The Bible says we, when we come together, we can call on the Lord together. And there's a corporate anointing, and and uh, and that speeds up the process. Amen. And so, uh, if you're in need of a physical touch from the Lord, I want you to just come up here. You say, "Well, why just physical?" Because when you're not feeling good, you need help there. Amen. If you're not feeling good, you need help there. And when the Lord touches you there. Nobody in the world can tell you he doesn't care. Right. Amen. So, it, for it, just a, as a sign to you, you know, I, and I want, I want you to, I want you to get a touch from the Lord. Amen. And uh, Robert, if you'll come, bring me that bottle of oil that you've got in your shirt pocket. Amen. Praise God. We'll anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Amen. You say, what can he do? Well, we know he can do anything. What will he do? We we know from what he's already done, he'll do anything. He'll he'll do anything. So it's up to us to make the call. Amen. And by anointing you with oil, I'm going to, I'm just going to roll this this uh, this frankincense on your forehead. That's just a a sign of the Holy Spirit's part in this. Holy Spirit is the oil of God. And when we anoint you with oil, we're not, we're, there's no magic. It's just, it's just a point of contact for you to release your faith. Amen. We'll start with you. God wants to heal you of an infection, right? Yes. In Jesus' name. Father, no infection can withstand the name of Jesus. And so we just speak to our sister's body right now. Be infection free. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Say it with me, Lord, I call upon your name. I call upon your name. To heal me. To heal me. Of this infection. And of anything else that's wrong in my body. I believe you care. And I receive my healing. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Brother Bill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nobody needs to tell you about these things. Hallelujah. Just be healed in your body. We speak to this heart to be whole. We command you to beat like you're supposed to beat. Beat on time. Stop racing or slowing down in Jesus' mighty name. We speak health to this body. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Sharon, we just believe God that you're healed from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And that you're going to outlive your mama. Hallelujah. Thank you. Who was in her 90s. Hallelujah. And Lord, you're surrounded. You're surrounding Sharon with some people that love her, that minister to her, that care for her. She's got it better than her mother had. And Lord, I just believe right now that she's healed 
and you satisfy her with long life on the earth. We give you praise for that. Praise God. Hallelujah, my brother. Whatever it is, God's greater. Brother Bradley, in the name of Jesus, I speak to your body. I command it by the authority that God has given me as a minister of the gospel and a believer. They shall lay hands upon the sick, and in my name they shall recover. And we speak health over this body in Jesus' name. Health and healing and restoration and recovery of everything lost in Jesus' name. Lord, let it be a sign and a wonder to Him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. We just speak to Brenda's body right now. You keep working. You keep being healed. You keep receiving God's healing power from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Hallelujah. Lord, give her a spring in her step. Cause her, Lord, to have energy that she uh, thought she would never have again. Speak speak your word over her, Lord. Your healing word in Jesus' name. We command these eyes to continue to improve. We thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. And Wendy, we just know that God is your healer. And with his stripes you have been, are, and will always be healed. Not by might, not by power, <laughs> but by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not by medicine, not by prescriptions, not by not by anything that you can add to or supplement your, your diet with, but just by the power of God. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Praise God. John, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. It's not something you earn or deserve. It's not something you can save up for over a long period of time. It's not something that you can get as a as a benefit from your labors, but it's the benefit given to you from His labors. He was bruised and beaten and ripped apart at the whipping post. And with those stripes, you are healed in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. One more. Oh, Robert. Praise God. Father, I just thank you that Robert is healed from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Every joint, muscle, fiber in his being, every organ and tissue is healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that by his stripes, Robert is healed. Amen. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Sandy. I'd like to go in at Proxy for Don Fleming. Don Fleming, yes. Because he fell and hurt himself when he was busy this morning. All right, we're going to anoint you with oil on behalf of Don Fleming, our precious brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just pray for Don right now in Jesus' name that you would heal him of that which causes him to be dizzy and to faint. Because he was injured, Lord, when he fell. But he fell because he was dizzy, and that's probably a heart issue or something. I ask you, Lord, to heal him. Touch his heart. He's chosen, Lord, to trust you and believe you. And we add our faith to his, and we believe for his healing today. In Jesus' mighty name. Heal him of his injuries as well. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise for sure, sister. Yes. Yes, Sharon's sister <laughs> taking chemotherapy. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just speak healing over this body. Yes. What was her name again? Donna. 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 Father, we know that Donna is clear across the country from us, but you're there with her, and we speak over her body in Jesus' name. Healing, 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 healing of cancer. Stage four, stage three, it don't matter, Lord. You're the healer of cancer. And we receive that healing in Jesus' name. Help her, Lord, to reach out and by faith embrace it. Help those around her, Lord, to contend for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Um, Kathy Hines uh, had uh, 
a cancerous tumor removed from her colon Friday, stage three cancer, I believe. And they say they got it all. And we're just believing God that they did. But be praying for Kathy Hines, Gary Hines' wife. Amen. They're well acquainted with the miracle power of God. And they're standing in faith and believing. Amen. But you know, when you're going through treatments and surgeries and things like that, you get these professionals that walk in there and they do everything they can to shoot down your faith, to scare you. They're covering their own behinds so they give you the worst case scenarios so that you won't sue them. But that doesn't do your faith. I mean, it's a fight. I've been there. I've been there. Several of you have been there. It's hard to maintain faith when the professionals are telling you the opposite. And so uh, same way with Sharon's sister Donna. She's going through chemotherapy. And, uh, and I, I'm telling you what, uh, the things you see, the things you feel, the things you hear work against your faith. Yeah. That's right. But we have a covenant with God. <laughs> sealed in the blood of His own Son. It says different from what everybody else says. And we're going to, we're going to celebrate that covenant right now with the communion. And so uh, Brother John's going to serve you the little communion cups. And everybody's welcome. You don't have to be a member of this church. All you got to be is a member of His body, the Lord Jesus. And if you love Jesus, we love you. <laughs> and you can take communion with us. Praise God. Amen. Doesn't get you any perks at the church, but it sure gets you the perks where it count. And that's what the Lord, the thing, everything that He purchased with His own body, and that's what we've been praying about this morning. When we're laying hands on you and praying for your bodies, we're 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 doing it on the basis of the covenant. This this little wafer, this little wafer says it's so. It says you can call upon God. For your body. Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. His body for your body. He took, according to Isaiah 53 5 and 1 Peter 2 24, He took in His own body our diseases, our sicknesses. And, you know, and the doubters, the unbelievers, they try to say, well, that means spiritual. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Jesus came along later to uh, demonstrate what it meant when He healed the sick, the blind, the deaf, raised the dead. That was all physical. Do you know that everybody Jesus healed? And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not one single one of them was born again. Not one single one of them was saved. Not one single one of them even knew who he was. They didn't know who he was. Everybody that came to him to be healed got healed. He never said no. There were many places where it says he healed all of them. And it wasn't talking about spiritual healing. It was all physical. It was all physical. When he went to the whipping post, he suffered many stripes on his back. And Isaiah and Peter both attest to the fact that those stripes were for your physical healing. This is our guarantee. When we eat this bread, we're saying, I receive the whole benefit, the full benefit of the death, the crucifixion, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It's all mine. Amen. Amen? So let's say it. Lord, this, is, this says it's all mine. When I eat this bread, I receive all that you have for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's eat together. And then, the blood, we know that the same night that he, Judas betrayed Jesus, he, he took the cup the Last Supper. And he said, this is my blood of the New Testament. New Testament means New Covenant. 
means new deal. Amen. And the Paul taught us in Hebrews that it's a better covenant than the the old one. Did you know that healing was in the old covenant? When God first cut the old covenant with Abraham, what did he do to Abraham? He healed him. He healed his wife. And that, that old couple were able to have babies again. See, when God cut the covenant in the Old Testament with Abraham, it was a healing covenant. And one of the first things God ever showed His people after He delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, the very night that He delivered them from Egyptian bondage, everyone in the, in the nation of Israel was healed. The psalmist said there was not one feeble among them. Three million people Slaves, slaves, you know there had to be some broken bones, there had to be some sicknesses, diseases, old people, blind people, deaf people, you know, three million people. But that night when they ate the sacrificial lamb and put the blood over their doorpost, that night they were all healed. Greatest healing service in the history of mankind. And that was just under the old covenant. Then in the wilderness, God reveals Himself as I am the Lord that healeth thee. He revealed Himself as their doctor. And He healed them. And throughout their time in the wilderness, their clothes didn't wear out. They always had everything they needed. And they were always healed. And there were times, you know, when they, they were judged because of their sin against God. And like the time when the snakes came in and bit them. And the Lord told Moses, just raise up this brazen serpent that's uh, 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 you know, a sign of Christ being raised up on the cross. And everyone that looks to that, though, even if he's snake bit, if he looks to that, he will be healed. That's the old covenant. Yeah, amen. Jesus said, I'm bringing you a new covenant built on better promises. So if you're healed under the old covenant, the new covenant's better then shouldn't you ought to be healed under the new covenant? There we go. Common sense, just reason. It's a fact as well, and it's also the truth. With His stripes we're healed, and by His blood we're confirmed worthy of that new deal. All the benefits are in the blood. Thank you, Lord, for Your blood. We receive it. We pour it into our bodies, but we pour it over our lives. And we receive every benefit of that new covenant in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. amen. Drink it all. Say why? Because you want it all. Amen. For too many years, preachers from pulpits have been preaching a partial gospel. They've been robbing people of their full inheritance and full benefits. This doesn't start after you die, folks. This starts when you begin to live. When you begin to live in Christ, this is where all this starts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's our guarantee. One time I thought I was having a heart attack. And uh, I told my wife to turn out the lights. I'll go wait in the car and you can take me to the emergency room. So while my wife is in there turning out the lights and checking her makeup or whatever, seems like forever, I'm sitting out in the car thinking I'm having a heart attack. And uh, all of a sudden I was reminded, I have a covenant with the Almighty God. It's sealed in the blood of His Son. It, it guarantees that by His stripes, I am healed. And I said, I just kept saying, I have a covenant sealed in the blood of God's own Son. I have a covenant sealed in the blood of God's own Son. I have a covenant sealed in the blood of God's own Son. When my wife got in the car, she says, you ready to go to the hospital? And I said, no, take me home. I'm fine. Because I was healed. Never had, a, never had that problem again. But I had to remind myself of the truth. You have a deal with God. 
And God always keeps His deal. God's not a dishonest God. God will keep what He keeps His word. You've got to deal with God, and that deal is sealed in the blood of His own Son. That makes it eternal. It cannot be annulled. It cannot be amended. It cannot be changed. It cannot be uh, in any way diminished. It will be in effect for eternity. This is the covenant we're going to live under throughout all ages. And you just drank to it. <laughs> Amen. How many of you are in agreement with it? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, then don't forget to ask for help. Praise God. Don't forget to call on Him for help. Stand up with me and let's just lift our hands to the Lord and thank Him for His goodness and His mercy to us this morning. Thank Him for touching these people that we prayed for. You know, we don't ask them, how do you feel? Because we're living by faith and not by sight. There's two ways that God can heal. He can heal instantly. He can heal instantly and He does. That's in the area of miracles. But he can also heal over time. The word healing implies over time. So you can begin to feel better. Now some of you, you have more faith for that than you do for instant. Me, I don't have patience for that. I want instant. But many times God has required me to you know, be healed over time. He may have you do something that requires obedience. I quit eating that stuff. Or go to bed at a decent hour. You know, there's some things that you know you know you need to do that will help you. And so you need to you need to he that knoweth to do not to him it is sin. Amen. If you don't do what you know to do, then you're gonna miss it. So you gotta cooperate with God. Remember Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. Well, if the man had stretched out the wrong hand, he wouldn't have been healed. 